Funding for your career is provided by Miller Media Group. Education for life. and that reacts to everything. People aren't prioritizing the protection of student athletes. You know, there is a fainting spell that leads into it. A lot of these kids can't distinguish that from just pushing limits. Being aware, being educated on how to respond is huge. Who we play for is a nonprofit movement to represent the thousands of communities, families, and teams across the country who all lost someone they love to a detectable heart condition. Um, and our dream is simple provide what we're recommending, electrocardiogram heart screenings for all student athletes. Wow, and I went to your website and was just fascinated by the information I read. Our viewers would probably think that these kids are dying from heart attacks, that it's just a, the heart condition is hereditary and the kids have a weak heart mm -hmm. and they just, that's how they go, with being right. overheated or whatever causes a heart attack. But the heart doesn't stop beating in a, in right. a heart attack. It, it is it continues to beat and it's a blockage. But what's the difference between sudden cardiac arrest and a heart attack? Yeah, that's a very good question. And just in layman's terms, as simple as you can put it, you gotta have SCA, sudden cardiac arrest, is like an electrical issue. And the way that we compare that to um, heart attacks is that it's more of a plumbing issue. So there could be some structural deficiencies going on in a, in a sudden cardiac arrest event but a lot of times it's that abrupt interruption of that electrical process that's going through the heart. And it just stops. Yes, it just yeah. stops completely. Stops or it'll go into something called uh, ventricular fibrillation, V-fib or A-fib, things like that. And that's, you know, when you apply an AED, that's what it's trying to, it's trying to reset that, uh, the pace that's going on with right. the heart. And what are the symptoms of sudden cardiac arrest? These are all incredible questions. Cause, and honestly, you can ask Evan, you can ask anybody that's in this space is that, there is that lack of education. Um, so you want to talk about signs and symptoms and things that we even personally saw with Rafe um, in our story when he collapsed, is that they do oftentimes, um, you know, there is a fainting spell that leads into it. There's the chest pain, things like that. What's unfortunate is that a lot of these kids can't distinguish that from just, you know, I exercise all the time. I put, I'm pushing my relative right. limits. I have chest pain. I'm short, you know, the fatigue and shortness of breath is there. I've wanted to faint before, you know, things like that, so. What is the age group that this affects most? I mean, I know, is it, you said college kids usually get tested for this, so is it in little league ball playing, or I mean, is, is it in small kids as well? And, and because they sometimes seem to be pushed beyond mm -hmm. what they um, know as on playground sports right. and that sort of thing. What, what is the age limit that, that should be, um, the real issue is that we don't know how many student athletes or students are dying from sudden cardiac arrest. We do know that based off some Google searches and the Parent Heart Watch, which is the national voice on sudden cardiac arrest, and preventing sudden cardiac arrest in youth, that there's about 35 cases in the last couple of years of sudden cardiac arrest. And that's just because we found them on Google and we found them through a couple other outlets. Right. And we know not every story makes the media, not every story is on the soccer field like ours was. So as far as their incidence rate, the one study we love to reference the most is from Dr. Kim Harmon out in Washington. She found that sudden cardiac arrest in D1 African American athletes, basketball players, the incidence rate is as high as about one in 3,200. So when oh it's very different from when we were growing up, we were told lightning strike one in a bajillion right. to one in 3,200. Um, the only difference with athletes, depending on the study you read, is that they have a higher likelihood of suffering sudden cardiac arrest because of the strains they put their heart under. Um, and we are total proponents of screening every student that ever walks into school, no doubt. 
but our focus first and foremost is the group that's at highest risk, right. the student athlete. And it's detectable and treatable. So how is that? How does that carry out after you have given the screening? Uh, it's a privilege to say that we screen around 75,000 uh, student athletes making us one of the biggest heart screening organizations, not just in the country, but in the world. And this is Florida? This is across eight states. Oh, my goodness, yeah. In one other country, yeah. Panama. Oh and for the record, goodness. we went to Panama purely <laughs> to prove we can do this thing anywhere. Anywhere. In a third world village in Panama right. to, you know, Cocoa Beach, Florida, to Tallahassee, Florida, to Texas, to everywhere. Um, and out of those 70,000 or 75,000 student athletes, we've caught around 63 student athletes who've had life-threatening heart conditions whose life was saved by a three to five minute electrocardiogram then identified a previously unknown cardiac abnormality. And outside of those 63, we've caught dozens of minor abnormalities that could one day lead to become well, a bigger problem. I was gonna say, what, you know, what would you say to the parents who were like, oh, well, it couldn't happen to my child? So who we played for was started um, after the loss of our teammate at Cocoa Beach High School, Rafe Macron. Rafe was a fierce competitor, uh, a loyal friend, a kid we played soccer with from third grade up until high school. Uh, after we lost Rafe at Cocoa Beach High School to the detectable heart condition, we went to college and we realized that what Rafe died of was something that thousands of kids across the country every single year will lose their lives to. We learned that if we had been raised in Italy, Israel, or Japan, every single student athlete would have the opportunity to get their heart checked with an ECG. We learned that the bottom of the FHSAA sports physical, you're advised in the fine print to get an electrocardiogram ECG. Uh, we learned that if you're a professional athlete or you're a big time collegiate athlete, you get an ECG before sports. Most of our high school kids and our college, mm -hmm. you said the college kids get the EKG. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference in the normal screenings that they get? Mm -hmm. Cool, so yeah, right now, if you play at FSU or you play at UF or you play at UCF, you can expect to get the full workup of an EKG, probably an echo, probably a couple more things. I and mean, that's just because of resources. Those schools have the resources and they have hospitals and doctors that are bought in on protecting their athletes because they're high profile. And you can guarantee if you're playing in the NBA or in the NFL, you have the same resources. So the issue that we saw that cost Rafe his life and thousands more of their lives is that people aren't prioritizing the protection of student athletes in middle school and high school, in sports clubs, and some colleges like Eastern Florida State College as well. Um, and the biggest thing ultimately is from a public health standpoint, some governing bodies don't believe it's an effective choice to provide the recommended ECG electrocardiogram because at the hospital, the ECG can cost up to $150 or more. But the way we deliver it, as Zane's gonna tell you a little later, is charging $15. And if you can't afford the $15, we give it to you free of charge. Oh because fortunately, goodness. we fundraise year round to pay for right. those kids. Right. When they get a normal screening, what, what constitutes a normal screening when, um, I mean, I, I taught at uh, Merritt Island Christian School, and I know they, they're, they were just kind of in, out, uh, done. So what is that? What does that do for them? That's a great question. So right now in the state of Florida, like many states in the country, there's a governing body for athletics. And it's generally a nonprofit association. It's not affiliated with the state, but the state will tell them what to do. So the current standard for our athletic body and every athletic body for amateur athletics in the United States is a sports physical. And as far as cardiac care goes, they're really only using a 14 point questionnaire and a family history in order to tell you whether or not you should qualify up to an EKG. Statistically speaking, that test that declares if you're eligible, if you're a healthy enough individual to step on the playing field and you are not consider, considered vulnerable to any cardiac event um, is less than 1% effective at actually detecting these abnormalities. EKG is upwards of 90 times more effective. And so that's our whole thing is that if you really want to provide these parents a peace of mind, if you really want to identify these kids before they put themselves at risk, you've got to do something about the standard because the standard is just an epic fail. You look at our story, Rafe, and it's unique to us because this was our community, this was our best friend, brother, however you want to say it. But his story is not uncommon when you look at the big picture. He fit the bill of health. He was, you know, a week away from his 16th birthday. He played every single sport that there was. He played hockey in Florida. He was a standout goalie. He was a downhill skier. He, he played flag football. I played just about every sport you could with him. He had asthma. Right? How many kids have asthma these days? And it's like, that's not even really a health issue anymore. Right. It's so prevalent. Right. And so what I would say to these parents is that 
Right now, the current standard isn't telling you enough. So you might as well take that extra look, and it doesn't, one, it doesn't take you very much time. And, you know, done through who we play for and other services out there, you can get it done affordably. There's not enough education out there right now, but it's starting to roll around. We've, we put a lot of work on the educational side of things, too, and we've worked with FHSAA to get the information out to parents. To tell our viewers a little bit about what you hope to accomplish in Tallahassee. Absolutely. So right now, as you'll find out later, our program costs $15 compared to 150 at the hospital for each student. We're going to the legislature and we're asking $500,000, which is a drop in the bucket for the legislature, for a program that addresses the biggest public health problem in athletics, exponentially more than concussions, exponentially more than heat wow. or exhaustion. Um, and with that $500,000, we can screen around 30,000 student athletes. The first community we want to do it in is our home community, Brevard. Um, and out of those 30,000 student athletes, we can statistically guarantee 28 kids' lives will be saved because we've done this 75,000 times. Uh, so we think that this is one of the most effective programs the state could possibly invest in because there's not many programs that can actually provide an innovative solution to a problem and eliminate it almost completely. Right. What we do know is that in countries like Italy where this has been delivered for all student athletes, sudden cardiac arrest has been uh, uh, reduced by 89 percent. So oh we're talking gosh, the lives of, mm -hmm. of dozens uh, of, th of potentially thousands over the years to be saved by three minute tests. Is it one ethnic group that is harder hit with this or does it is it just? So the, the problem with the system now is that kids are born or develop congenital heart problems. You know, they're born there, they develop through puberty or, or some other way. Um, and we're waiting to react with an AED to do something about it. And that's a problem. We're in a world of medicine that reacts to everything. One stat we love throwing out is that um, in our case with Rafe, even if we would have used the AED immediately, and we did do CPR immediately, we only had a 38% chance of survival for Rafe. So, and that's reacting to a problem. Now on the flip side, if we would have used what was advised in uh, FHSA's physical form, we'd have about an 85 to a 90% chance of identifying his heart condition and many others before they were actually a problem. So as far as groups that are more at risk, like we mentioned earlier, Dr. Kim Harmon says uh, African-American basketball players, you know, statistically for whatever reason, are about one in 3,200, but we know ultimately the issue is kids with heart problems that our society is waiting to react towards. So the way our program runs, and we can elaborate in a little bit, um, you enter into our program, right, and this is something that we work very closely with the administration. We want the administration to take as much ownership as this as possible. The everything, school administration. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So everything down to the actual delivery of the results. We have somebody, and this is how we comply with HIPAA, someone HIPAA certified at the school who's our point of contact and will deliver the results once we receive the consultation back from our cardiologists. And that's so that the school ultimately will have access to the information that came back from our, our cardiologist consultation. So now they have the full ability to, if they come back as a high risk individual based off of that interpretation, they, they have the ability to withhold them from, from sports. And just to clarify on what those levels are that come back from the consultations, is you could be low risk, you could be uh, needing further review, which is like our follow-up category, and then there's high risk. And basically the differences between the follow-up in the high risk categories is basically the intensity of what he saw. If there's like abnormal Q waves and it, and it still falls within a certain range of abnormality, and that's just one example, our cardiologist will say, he's just in the further review category. He can continue to play within the season or continue to maintain the, maintain the lifestyle that he's in if he exercises regularly. But this is a priority he needs to take within the next two to three months to go and get that follow up go and get cleared. It's, so it's treatable right. to get them well enough to go back in that they're not, and they're not at risk. Yes, ma'am. And, and honestly, Evan had touched on it a little bit. We've, we've had about 63 kids that have come back that have needed some form of medical intervention. And probably my favorite stat, since we're all dropping <laughs> pretty great statistics here, is that only eight kids have not been able to go back to the lifestyle that they were in. They're a competitive soccer player, if you were one of those eight kids that they weren't able to go back to the level of athletics that they were playing before. A lot of these though, and I think the, one of the biggest, uh, basically bridges that we could get, or the gaps we could bridge here is that fear, and that's that 
The remainder of kids, it was a very simple intervention. Yes, you know, if they're at that level, it was invasive most likely, but these are kids that were back on the field within a week, two weeks wow. in a lot of circumstances or just being monitored uh, through medications, things like that, but are able to live a completely healthy lifestyle. Now, is this just athletes? Or does this, I mean, it, I know it affects right. mostly mm -hmm. athletes, but is it something that right. everyone's kind of carrying yeah. around and, and it's just hovering in there that no one knows about? Yeah, that kind of prompts a, a beautiful response that we use, and that's that kids aren't dying because they're athletes. They're vulnerable because they're athletes, but they're kids that are dying because they have heart disease and it's going undiagnosed. So what we're trying to do is enhance that detection process and early detection is the only way mm -hmm. to get these kids. So what kind of funding do you, are you aiming for? Are you mm -hmm. looking for? You said earlier that, it, that if you had a, um, was it $500,000 mm -hmm. or that, that was yeah. the, the cap, would that help all of Florida mm -hmm. or just one, a couple of counties or yeah. is it up to the county to help you out here and, and make mm -hmm. that a priority? Mm -hmm. So ultimately, we uh, the funding as of now for seventy-five thousand ish, um, either comes from private donations or our fundraisers, and more th more so than that though comes from charging the families directly fifteen dollars for the service. But what we know is that there's plenty of schools that can't afford that; they're on the lower end socioeconomic status, and we don't want even fifteen dollars to be the barrier to entry for any student athlete or any family. Amazing. But the beauty is, I mean, we we've done this seventy-five thousand times now. We're getting pretty good at this we have a system that works. But what we need more than anything is the ability to hire more people to deliver this service across the state. Um, so I think for us, it's finding a big funding source so we can scale it up to deliver uh, the solution, the biggest public health problem in the school system. Now, could a school individually raise money to have you come screen their athletes? And what would that yeah. charge? What would that charge be? I guess it's yeah. per kid and yeah, how, exactly. how much you know, how much they would need. Yeah, exactly. But is that you would go directly to the kids and, yeah, and they would contact you. <clears throat> so a perfect example of that, shout out to Health First. We love you guys. Thank you so <laughs> much for sponsoring <laughs> us. Uh, but Health First, they've donated $10,000 to pay for a couple schools uh, that are on the low, lower socioeconomic status to get completely free heart screens for all their student athletes. Wow. So it's beautiful. And the, the, the big thing about our program is once you get over the hump of getting in the first year, it really does, as we've seen, for 200 plus schools become a part of the culture of the school. Um, so now, every time you're doing a physical and you're collecting the physical form, you're now collecting the consent form. Right. And thanks to Health First, we're gonna be able to screen, I think it is 267 kids, no, no more than 667 yeah, kids. Uh, math. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I, that's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, so, how did you come up with this other than Rafe? I mean, mm -hmm. did it, it's it's a big thing to put together a nonprofit that would be specific in this. I mean, you yeah. would you would have to. Uh, I can't even imagine. I mean, I know your friend has died, and how how did the idea come to you mm -hmm. to do this? I love that question. So, uh, it really was it was something we wanted to do since the day Rafe collapsed. We had a ton of support from people throughout our Cocoa Beach and Brevard community. Um, as far as fundraising for scholarships and AEDs. You knew this would help and, have helped him, though. Yes. So, and, and at that time, we didn't know anything about electrocardiogram heart screens. We had no idea. We just knew about AEDs, and we knew that we wanted to do something. Now, tell me what that is. Tell me exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's an automa automated elect uh, external defibrillator. An AED is an automated external defibrillator. So there are schools around the county. Um, and and just lives. for those people that don't know, tell, can you tell us what that is? Mm -hmm. So if someone goes down... There's usually one, hopefully, in your athletic trainer office or your front office. Is that the thing that goes Exactly. Whoop. Yep. That's that's okay. Pat, yeah, okay. Yeah. Side note, you should know where yours is at your school. Okay. If you have one. If you have one. And if you don't have that's, one. Yeah. If you don't have one, shame. Yeah. yeah. Reach out to us. We can maybe help find someone who can't get you one. And what is the cost of that for, for the athletic departments? It's about $2,500. Yeah. Very expensive. And just in that, is, as, as long as we're talking about knowing where your AED is, Check in with your school administration and make sure you guys have an emergency action plan, I would say is a big thing. Mm -hmm. They gotta know how to respond. And the schools that have, like you mentioned, the 38 percentage um, or 38 percent survival rate, if you're a first responder within like the first minute or so, you know, that really increases if you have a 
a sound emergency action plan, mm -hmm. people that are ready to respond to these circumstances. Not just the school nurse who brings ice. Right, you exactly, because generally even, it's not. No. Generally it's your your PE coach or... And they if, might if not even be hallways, at the game. Yeah. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the thing. I mean, yeah. I see... You know, I've been to games where they look up and they wait for a doctor to come down exactly. from the stands, and that's mm -hmm. that's kind of frightening. But there should always be somebody who's trained right. with an AED to, right, exactly. to do this. And it's like we mentioned, it's not just athletes that are going into cardiac arrest. You know, yeah. you could be in second period, and it could be an art class, and you're a child with a heart condition right. predisposes you to SCA, and you, and you collapse in class. So just being aware, being educated on how to respond and when you need to respond is, mm -hmm. is huge. Wow. And then we digress a little bit. Yeah. No, Actually, that's okay. And back to your question of how yes, we kind of got excited. Yes, I'm sorry. I was no, the one no who took it. you down in a little buddy trail, didn't I? We're getting excited. <laughs> we're getting, get us on the who we play for stuff. We'll go all day. But uh, yeah, so uh, way back when in room 114 in our fraternity house, we dreamed up three ways we could address this. One was AEDs, two was CPR, three was with heart screenings. We saw uh, the most important being heart screenings. We just didn't know how to do it, really. But we knew we could fundraise for AEDs and we could get out emergency action plans to schools. Uh, but ultimately, we ended up putting on our first heart screening, and we called every parent heart watch organization just like us across the country to just learn from them, pick their brain, as collaborative as it can be, we're all in it for the same reason. And we found this group out in Texas, um, and we ended up merging with them. And they were the brilliant minds that had developed the system and the procedures of delivering in the school. Because what we saw firsthand, which in our eyes uh, was the last story we needed to hear, on if it should be delivered or not be delivered in the school system. It was up in Tallahassee, there was a death at Gobby High School. Uh, and about one week bef uh, after that, we had planned our community Saturday heart screening compared to how we now, now do it in the schools. And we went to that school, we talked to everybody, we promoted the heck out of it. Free electrocardiogram ECG heart screenings. Holy Comforter Middle School, come get your heart checked. And the only person that came from Gobby was the mother of the student athlete that passed away at Gabi one week prior. So to look at her and to, be, and to know that we didn't get one kid from Gabi, not one kid. And why? Because you know what? It just wasn't something those kids maybe were advertised good enough for or maybe they couldn't get a ride to Holy Comfort or the private middle school down the road. But we screened a lot of kids and we, we had a blast, but it wasn't all kids. So we learned pretty quickly, thanks to the organization we merged with from Texas too, that this needs to be delivered the same way that in the school system our kids get their eyes, their ears, and their backs tested. Right. Because sometimes, you know, you get letters in the mail. I know I've had mm -hmm. for lifeline screening, and I just pitch it and think, oh, mm -hmm. that's not going to happen to me. But yeah. it's, it's yeah. really important to, to say, ooh, but it might. And, yeah. You know, until it happens to somebody that you care about, it's, it's really mm -hmm. not something that finds its way to your radar. Right. Um, well, so in Tallahassee, when you, is there someone there that is your contact point? I mean, do you go in and, and um, like, just sit there and wait for your opportunity to speak? Or how, how do they, I mean, is it on the books to, mm -hmm. for something to, to happen? You mean in the legislature? Yes. No, we're looking for a legislator. Somebody come help us. Yeah, we have it all laid out. We got lobbyists help. So we you got really everybody. don't have a contact point. Well, we haven't been able to get it over the hump. And everybody says the same thing. It's a three-year process for appropriation. We, we definitely need help. Right. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, gosh, what would be the one thing that you think um, our viewers could help mm. help you do and promote yeah. so I think who there, we play for? We had to have a couple of takeaways. I think it would look something like this. And Zane, feel free to add on. Yeah. The first one, there's only so many of us. There's only so many people who've lived sudden cardiac arrest um, or have someone who's been affected by a heart condition in their family. And we need you to buy in, but we also need all of Brevard County to buy in. This is a tragedy that our entire community faced, and we collectively have believed from the very beginning that if everybody in Brevard made it just a priority, not their top, but a priority, then we could use Brevard as a model to change the way the country does something. So first and foremost, if you guys know a sports team, a school, whether it's Eastern Florida or um, you know, West Shore, any school, we're ready to screen yesterday. So reach out to us through the website. We'll be there tomorrow. Uh, we'll drive down from anywhere. <laughs> we will be there. Good. And it's a turnkey simple event. The second piece would be we have a book that just came out. It's called Bliss. Um, it's a fictional romance novel based on the story of who we play for with 50% of the proceeds going to who we play for. Every single dollar we get provides heart screens for kids in Brevard County. And the third, 
We'd love to see you guys out at our December to Remember fundraisers in Cocoa Beach um, and our 5K. Well, listen up, Brevard. I'm telling you, this is a really worthy, worthy organization, who we play for. And one thing I read on the, on the website, we all play for someone. We all play in honor of someone. We all play for uh, someone special in our lives. And that's the driving force behind what we do and who we are. All, just that's the bottom line. So Evan and Zane, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope our viewers will contact your website and get on board and uh, let's protect our kids and help out our schools so that our children are safe when they play ball and when they play any athletic sport. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time. More information about this program is available online at millermediagroup.org. Funding for your career is provided by Miller Media Group, education for life.